Howdy readers, I'm Jason, this is Chapter and Verse, and uh, if you are new to my channel, and I know a handful of you are, uh, it seems like I've got, I don't know, 25 or so new subscribers in the last month, uh, which is nice, uh, because I had a really, really long spell there uh, where I would look at my analytics and it would say over the last 28 days, your net gain in subscribers is minus 10 or minus 6. Uh, and so that was a little strange, a little disheartening. Um, and I mean, I know some of the reasons why uh, I'd gotten away from doing tags and I'm doing a series about death. Those things tend not to make one subscriber count um, balloon. And I, I understand that. Um, but it's been nice uh, over the course of ShakeTube to see uh, the subscriber count begin to grow again. But anyway, since there are some uh, new followers among you, you'll uh, want to know that um, one of the features here on my channel, and I try to do it every month, it doesn't always happen, but I try to do it once a month, um, it's called a ramble with the yarn, uh, where I just sit here and uh, work on uh, this blanket that I'm making for our cat and chat with you guys uh, about uh, bookish things, uh, either that are in the news or that have been on my mind. So I have three things in particular that I wanted to talk with you about tonight. Uh, and the first of those is Victober. I'm not paying attention at all really to the challenges, um, but I am gonna try to do some reading. And uh, uh, the first book that I'm going to try to get read uh, for October is uh, The War of the Worlds. I'm familiar with the story. I work in radio and, uh, you know, and, and uh, the radio story of this, right, the Orson Welles um, prank, one might call it, uh, is, is absolutely famous, um, infamous even. Um, and, uh, and I've seen at least one of the films, um, the Steven Spielberg film with Tom Cruise, where I think the first half of that is perfection. I think it's some of the best work Spielberg's ever done. And it kind of comes apart a little bit at the end, but I've wanted to read the novel for a very long time. So I'm going to be reading that, uh, next month. I'm going to be trying to anyway. And then the other book I'm going to be reading is not um, a work of Victorian uh, literature or nonfiction. It is instead a biography about a Victorian writer. Uh, and it's this recent biography of Tennyson. So um, it's not a beautiful cover. Either in mid-October or late October, I'm going to take three days off work, three use three of my vacation days, and um, around a weekend so that I have a five-day weekend. And I am going to do, just like Jay Shea did last year with his Jay Shea-a-thon, I'm going to have a Jason-a-thon, read-a-thon, where I just take five days and do little else but read, maybe crochet, maybe do a little vlogging, and, um, and we'll see how that goes. But um, I'm really looking forward to it. October is my favorite month of the year for the weather. Although it's been much warmer uh, this September uh, than it usually is in September. So I'm a little bit worried about what that means for October, I suppose. But we'll see. Uh, hopefully by the time Jasonathon rolls around, uh, the weather's going to be in the 40s and 50s. And I'll be able to drink hot chocolate. And it'll be uh, absolutely fabulous. So anyway, those are my October plans. Um... As to the other things that I wanted to talk to you guys about, these are things in the news. And one is uh, something I just learned about today. So there was an article in The Guardian, um, maybe a week ago thereabouts, uh, that I just became aware of, and um, it is kind of breathtaking. So for those of you who haven't heard, it seems as though scholars have stumbled upon a rather wonderful uh, literary discovery. Here is a first folio of Shakespeare's work that has been in um, the collection of some library, I don't know if it's a university library or what it is exactly, but some library somewhere in uh, Pennsylvania, I think, since the 1940s. And uh, <clears throat> they, you know, had no idea who owned it um, originally, right? I mean, this is one of the original first folios that was published in, like, 
1623 or 1622, whatever it was. And, um, and it's filled with handwritten annotations. Well, um, some academic from um, somewhere in Pennsylvania did a project or a paper uh, on this specific first folio. And another academic um, read the paper uh, or project and included in the paper were photographs, uh, images of, um, of some of these handwritten annotations. Well, this scholar who read the paper just happened to be a John Milton scholar. And, uh, and he saw the, uh, the images of the pages from the first folio. And um, he thought, wow, that looks a little bit like, or more than a little bit like, John Milton's handwriting. He um, says that he has thought similar things about other handwriting and manuscripts in the past uh, and has been wrong. Uh, but the more he studied it, the more he looked, um, the more he, he, he made his way through the annotations themselves as well, he became more and more convinced. And when he put it out there that he thought he had discovered John Milton's copy of the first folio annotated in his own hand, um, other scholars started looking into it as well. And... They're not quite at consensus yet, but consensus seems uh, pretty near that this uh, copy of the first folio that has been in this Pennsylvania library for, I don't know, 60 years now or something like this, uh, was John Milton's. And so for us to have uh, Milton's own copy of Shakespeare's first folio with Milton's notes in it so that we can go back and look at those notes and see how what his observations might have been uh, informed Milton's own poetry, um, I think is uh, kind of breathtaking. When I found out about this earlier today, it gave me goosebumps. This is the kind of thing that A.S. Byatt wrote about in her novel Possession, right, with the, uh, the fictional poets Christabel Lamott and Randolph Henry Ashe. Um, a connection like that between two uh, important writers and... Um, I mean, how often does something like this actually occur? So what I'm going to do is I will leave a link um, because there's a hell of a lot more to the story than I have, have explained to you guys, um, including a really wonderful telling detail um, that involves the rhyming of the words whist and kissed um, in, uh, in this Guardian article. So I'm going to link that article in the description box below. I urge you all to go and read it because it's, it's just freaking awesome, and I hope to God that, uh, that this ends up being true, because it would be, um, I just think, invaluable for Shakespeare and Milton studies. And, uh, and it's not as often as we'd like that writers yeah. whose body of work has been poured over and written about um, at such length over centuries, it's not very often that, um, that we have some new twist in the story that is bona fide and um, thrilling and refreshing um, and that, that cast light on, on really everything involved uh, with the studies of, of, of these writers' works. So um, this, could be, this could be a real event. It could be uh, monumental. Anyway, so The Guardian, a few days back, released its list of what uh, its critics thought uh, were or are the best 100 books, fiction and nonfiction combined, of the 21st century. And I thought, oh, this will be cool to, to look through. And it was. I wanted to walk through the Guardian list of 100 books with you guys uh, for just a few minutes. So, let me bring it up here. Number 100, Nonfiction by Nora Ephron. I have not read that. Uh, number 99, um, a work in translation called Broken Glass. Never even heard of that. Uh, 98, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Um, I thought that was kind of a cool, provocative choice. Um, just because it's a, it's a genre novel, um, people don't tend to take it very seriously, I don't think. It's a really creepy really creepy novel um it's the best book of that trilogy by by some some margin um 97 harry potter and the goblet of fire i've only read the first harry potter book i didn't like it so i never read further um 
enough people have told me that I need to that I probably will at some point. We'll see. Uh, 96, A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara. I have zero interest in reading that book. Uh, 95, Chronicles, Volume 1 by Bob Dylan. Um, can't stand Bob Dylan. When Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for Literature, I felt like throwing up. Um, I think I was genuinely hot under the collar angry about that for probably five or six days. Uh, the Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell, never read that. Dark Man's by N Nicola Barker. Super, super keen to read that. Have been for years. Um, I could see myself buying that sometime soon. Uh, the Siege by Helen Dunmore, again. Uh, I think Paul, my friend Paul from uh, from PK's Books, um, I think is a big fan of that book, if memory serves. Um, Light by M. John Harrison. It's cool to see some science fiction on there. Um, Visitation, Jenny Erpenbeck, another work in translation I have not heard of. Um, or maybe I have heard of that. I think I have heard of that. I think I actually have that marked to read on Goodreads. Uh, Bad Blood, Lorna Sage. It's not ringing any bells off the top of my head. Knots and Crosses. I think that's YA. Um, Priest Daddy, I believe, is a memoir, uh, which I also have marked to read on my uh, Goodreads. Uh, 86 Adults in the Room by Yanis Varoufakis. Varoufakis. I have no idea what the what the hell that is. 85 The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. That's hilarious. Um, they had to have they had to have a little comic relief in there for me. Um, 84 The Cost of Living. Deborah Levy. Don't know it. Uh, Tell me how it ends. Another work in translation. Um, unfamiliar with that. Coraline by Neil Gaiman. Uh, I have not read that. I've seen the film. I like the film. Harvest by Jim Crace is a wonderful novel. Um, just absolutely atmospheric. It's one of these books that takes place in uh, this kind of little known corner of history. Um, rural agricultural history. And it's just marvelous, really. Uh, I don't remember what beat that for the Booker Prize. Um, but it was a finalist for the Booker Prize. And, uh, and it would have been an absolutely worthy winner. Uh, Stories of Your Life and Others, which uh, apparently was the inspiration for, or the basis of, the film um, Arrival, which was quite a good movie. Spirit Level, don't know, Fifth Season, I think Lukash and Brian, um, Lukash from Totally Pretentious and Brian from Bookish, I think just did a buddy read of that, and, uh, and really loved it. Uh, Signs Preceding the End of the World, it's a great title. Thinking Fast and Slow, not such a great title. Number 75, Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, I think is one of the greatest titles I have ever read. Um, I am unfamiliar with the book. I have not read it yet, but um, but I know a few people who have uh, and who were impressed with it. 74 Days Without End by Sebastian Barry. So, <clears throat> so when I did the My Favorite Writers book tag recently, um, I found myself wishing that there was one more category beyond favorites, maybes, and not quites. And that category was writers uh, from whom you've read only one book, but, um, but that book was one that you loved so much and that struck such a chord in you that uh, you have very good reason to believe uh, that when you finally get around to reading more books by that author, um, that author is going to pole vault his or her way into your maybes or favorites. Uh, one of those writers for me was uh, E.L. Doctorow. I've only read uh, his novel City of God, which I absolutely adore. I'm super, super keen to read the Book of Daniel. I'm not sure why I haven't yet. Uh, but anyway, um, the 74th book on this list, Days Without End by Sebastian Barry, um, is a book by Barry that I haven't read. And I've only read his novel Annie Dunn. Um, but that novel is kind of perfect. Um, it's so beautiful. It has uh, maybe my favorite or second favorite opening of any novel I've ever read. Uh, I've also read uh, one of Barry's collections of poetry, which I wasn't terribly keen on, but, um, but his prose style is just so beautiful, and I can't wait to read uh, Days Without End. Nothing to Envy. It looks like nonfiction about North Korea, Age of Surveillance Capitalism. The title speaks for itself. 
Jimmy Corgan, the smartest kid on earth. No ton of scandal. Um, the infatuations. Consta Gardner, it's cool to see John Le Carr, or John Le Carre um, here on the list. Uh, Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. Uh, I know people who loved that book, uh, who read it for the Book Two Prize judging uh, this year. And I know people who did not like that book uh, nearly so well as some of the others. So, so that was fascinating. Seems to be a pretty divisive book. Seven Brief Lessons on Physics. Gone Girl. That seems a little odd, but I haven't read it, so I will refrain from passing judgment. On Writing by Stephen King. I have never heard anything but good stuff about that book. Uh, 63, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. I've heard great things. Mother's Milk by Edward St. Alban. Um, heard great things. This House of Grief. Dart by Alice Oswald. I don't know what the hell that is. The Beauty of the Husband. Haven't heard of. Post-War. The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. I have not read it, but I really want to. Underland, I've heard tremendous things about. That's the new Robert McFarlane book, uh, Work of Nature Writing. Omnivore's Dilemma, Women in Power. Peter Carey's True History of the Kelly Gang comes in at number 53. Um, deservedly, that is a masterpiece. Uh, that won the Booker Prize. Interestingly, a book that was up against it for the Booker Prize, in which True History of the Kelly Gang beat, Ian McEwan's Atonement, uh, that actually ranks higher on this list. Uh, Small Island by Andrea Levy. Brooklyn by Colm Toybean. That movie is... Oh, that, that's one of my favorite films uh, of the century so far. Um, I have not read the book yet. Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. That's like my brother's favorite book. I'm sort of lukewarm on that. Um, yeah, Margaret Atwood's a... I don't know. She doesn't sit terribly well with me. Um, Why Be Happy When You Can Be Normal by Jeanette Winterson. Really, really want to read that. Night Watch by Terry Pratchett. Persepolis. Human Chain, some poetry there from Seamus Heaney. Levels of Life by Julian Barnes. Uh, Hope in the Dark by Rebecca Solnit, No Clue. Citizen, an American Lyric. Moneyball by Michael Lewis. There's Atonement, number 41. That's a hell of a book. It's not better than True History of the Kelly Gang, but it's a hell of a book. Year of Magical Thinking, White Teeth, I Couldn't Freaking Stand. Sorry. I'm sorry, Jasmine. I'm sorry. Number 38, The Line of Beauty by Alan Hollinghurst. Uh, another Booker Prize winner, but I have not read that one. The Green Road by Anne Enright. Experience, Martin Amos. The Hair with Amber Eyes. Some, some more nonfiction there. Outline by Rachel Cusk. Um, that's weird. They <clears throat> put in bold the title of her book and also by Rachel in bold. So it reads almost like the book title is Outline by Rachel, and it's written by an author named Cusk, which is uh, which is kind of funny. Fun Home by Alison Bechtel, a graphic novel, graphic memoir, I really haven't read that. The Emperor of All Maladies, uh, it's a book about cancer that I really want to read. Um, from what I understand, uh, the book posits that there can be no curing cancer because there isn't just one cancer, there are many cancers, plural. And all of them adapt like a bastard. Um, constantly thwarting uh, or looking to thwart efforts uh, to eradicate them. From what I understand, it's not a terribly uh, hopeful book, but if you've read The Emperor of All Maladies, um, and I'm wrong about that, um, do let me know because I'm curious to read it. The Argonauts by Maggie Nelson. Super curious to read that. The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, what else did that win? I think it might have won the National Book Award too. Uh, a Death in the Family by Steve Donahue's favorite writer, Carl Ova Nosgaard. Um, number 28, Rapture by Caroline Duffy. Um, yes, I thought Caroline Duffy was a poet, and I was correct. 27, Hate Ship, Friendship, Courtship, Love Ship, Marriage, collection of short stories by Alice Munro, which is marvelous. Just a beautiful, beautiful book. Uh, 26, Capital in the 21st Century. I don't know what that is. 25, Normal People by the Republic of Sally Rooney, uh, which had been the Republic of, of Ireland, uh, from what I understand, until just recently. Um, it's another uh, thing that Steve Donahue made me aware of. Thank you, Steve. Uh, number 24, Visit from the Goon Squad. Um, I know Kelly was surprised to see that book make it so high onto the list. Uh, she read it for her Pulitzer Project, and she didn't like it very much, and she felt like it was a book that was going to be 
uh, dated pretty quickly. That was going to feel dated pretty quickly. And it's been eight years now. And um, it's number 24 on this list. So uh, 23, The Noonday Demon. Don't know it. 22, Tenth of December by George Saunders. So I haven't read any of Saunders' short stories. But I was really, really surprised to see this book um, make the list and uh, and his novel Lincoln and the Bardo failed to make this list. Uh, Lincoln and the Bardo, here we are in late September. I read that book in January. Uh, it is still the best book I have read this year. Uh, Sapiens, number 21, Life After Life, number 20. Uh, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. I read that years ago, and it's a good book. Um, the Shock Doctrine, Naomi Klein, number 18. Number 17. Number 17 is The Road by Cormac McCarthy. That makes me very happy. Clearly, uh, The Guardian critics stand by The Road as well. Uh, 16, The Corrections by Jonathan Franzen. Um, you know, the only thing I really know about that book from the conversations I've had from people over the years about it, the only thing I really remember is that there's a talking poop in it, I think. I've heard that. Is that true? Is there a talking turd in The Corrections by Jonathan Franzen? The Sixth Extinction, um, number 14, Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. Um <sighs> Probably not her best book. I think The Night Watch is her best book. But Fingersmith is um, maybe her second best book. And it is arguably the most exhilarating reading experience I have ever had when I read that book. Uh, number 13, Nickel and Dimed by Barbara Ehrenreich. Number 12, The Plot Against America by Philip Roth. Certainly, um, world events, um, being what they are, had some uh, influence over that book being so high on the list. I haven't read The Plot Against America, but I definitely want to. Uh, number 11, My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante. Number 10, Half of a Yellow Sun. Number 9, Cloud Atlas. Number 8, Autumn, uh, which I actually just bought for Kelly when I was down in Denver at the Tattered Cover. Uh, number seven, Between the World and Me by Tanahisi Coates. Number six, The Amber Spyglass, the third book in Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy. I've only read the first book in that series. Uh, didn't like it, so didn't finish the, the trilogy. Although I may go back one day and give it all another shot. We will see. I know enough people who revere it um, for it may be to be worth my while. Number five, Austerlitz by W.G. Seabald. Uh, my friend and uh, former uh, creative writing instructor, Jane, loves that book. Uh, has been after me for years to read that book. I just haven't done it yet. Uh, number four, Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. Um, it's a great novel. It's a novel I've read twice. I liked it more the second time. I like it more the more I think about it, actually. That book seems to me... So it was voted uh, when it came out. Time Magazine chose it as the best novel of the year. I suspect Never Let Me Go's reputation is going to just continue to grow with every year. Um, for whatever reason, that book struck a chord in people, I think. And it feels, it feels like it could be prescient, right, down the road. Um, and uh, I wasn't at all surprised to see never let me go uh, make this list now the funny thing is so from the headline you know that this is a list of the books that they think are the best books of the 21st century so far granted they start that century at year 2000 instead of 2001 but you know be that as it may i find it hilarious that of the thousands of comments below this story in the guardian there were all these people who were like Oh, well, I really liked Never Let Me Go, but I thought The Remains of the Day should have been on the list instead. Unaware, I suppose, that, uh, that The Remains of the Day was published in the late 1980s. Um, people were like, oh, The Road is really wonderful, but Blood Meridian was better. It should have been on the list instead. Again, same thing. I'm not sure. I mean, these people can clearly read. They've read the novels. Um, I'm not sure how they missed the headline of the piece. The whole reason the story exists, right? This list exists. Number three, Secondhand Time uh, by Svetlana Alexievich. So that is a book that I bought uh, last year uh, because of BookTube, right? So Neil Griffiths, uh, who doesn't make videos anymore, which just breaks my heart, but Neil Griffiths did a review of that book. And um, 
it just absolutely persuaded me to buy it. Uh, and so I did. I haven't read it yet, but I, I greatly look forward to it. Number two, Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. Um, God, it just, it does a heart good to see uh, Richard Dawkins ranked like 85 or something on the list. And, um, and then Gilead to be ranked number two. And number one, they chose Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. And I really can't um, complain about that. It's a huge book. Uh, I think more than 600 pages. I've read it twice. I'm going to be reading it again in January, um, taking some of my subscribers through it uh, with me. And we're going to be doing a read along of Wolf Hall, Bring Up the Bodies, and then in March, for March of the Mammoths, uh, The Mirror and the Light, which is the most exciting um, literary uh, publication on the horizon of my entire life actually so um yeah i've got no uh, no complaints whatsoever about them choosing wolf hall as number one so that was the list i will leave a link to that article as well in the description box um you know uh peek through it let me know which books on that list you've read um what you thought of them and uh yeah yeah this has been it's been fun i always look forward to these uh to these little rambles um they are uh, productive for me um, in a very practical way, right? I get a little crocheting done on a project that I've been working on for, it seems like, forever. But then I also just get to chat with you guys a little bit in a more kind of relaxed, uh, free-form way, which uh, I enjoy. And uh, enough of you have told me over the last year or so that you enjoy um, that, yeah, it certainly makes it worth uh, worth my time to sit down and... and uh, and just chat, just chat with you guys while I work yarn through my fingers. Um, anyway, I uh, hope you all had a good work week. And I will see you again this weekend for my uh, last ShakeTube video of 2019. In the meantime, adios.